This is a type of video book. You, the viewer, are encouraged to treat it as any other book. Skip ahead to certain The medium for communicating science must be as up-to-date as the science itself. As the power of computers has grown, so must the ways of presenting the results. Mere lists of numbers, graphs, or even video segments are not enough. This video book is complete with its own references, equations, and detailed technical explanation. It is a powerful tool available to educate and inform scientists and the public. These images show the results of detailed computer simulations of the surface of a metal as it is being hit by an atom. Every atom affects the others. The colors show how strong the interactions are. The arrows show where each atom is moving. In real time, this whole process takes only 40 femtoseconds. In that amount of time, light travels only one quarter of an inch. In this simulation, the incoming atom makes violent collisions. Here, here, and here. How atoms collide with one another and what they do after they collide was unknown before work like this. Visualization is a necessary tool for thorough comprehension. Plots like this quantify how the speed changes and show the energy change of the incident atom. The large number of rapid collisions, punctuated by virtually unperturbed glides across the surface, was totally unexpected. The very computer chips which made this simulation possible were made by atoms interacting with surfaces. Future computers, with the power to realize today's dreams, can only be built if the technology to make their components dramatically improves. Understanding and visualizing these fundamental interactions is the first step towards that goal. It is my hope that this publication will foster more understanding and thereby help lead to continued success in those fields. Amber software is used on a Cray-2 supercomputer to simulate the motion dynamics of molecules. Here, the water is removed and the cystinoleukotriene molecule, LTD4, is fixed in place. Researchers are often interested in comparing the shapes of related molecules. This video is a study of the techniques we used to evaluate the shapes of three related molecules. LTC4, LTD4, and LTE4 as they change over time. A direct approach to shape evaluation involves observation of the molecular dynamics. The viewer is expected to review these scenes multiple times to compare and contrast the dynamics of each molecule. Each molecule is placed on a stage with colored shadows to provide an integrated visual scene. Notice how the tail on the left hooks differently for each molecule. Also note the varying curvatures of the arms to the right. A derivative approach to shape analysis uses three-dimensional histograms, clustering, density and the shape of the histograms are important clues about the dynamics of their respective molecules. Four key atoms from a common substructure of each molecule are used to create the histogram. The histogram is divided into a discrete number of regions along each dimension called buckets. A sphere is displayed for each bucket in the histogram that was hit by a molecule. Representative molecule configurations are recorded for each bucket. The bucket and its representative are shown and can be cross-referenced with the shadow display for more precise shape analysis. A holistic approach to shape analysis displays many dynamic time steps for each molecule at once. Atoms are scaled down to prevent the obscuring of data. Densities of color reveal the preferred configurations of each molecule. 
The same holistic data is shown here, superimposed to once again compare and contrast molecular shapes over time. Each molecule is colored to match its label.
The successful operation of a backhoe requires the operator to see all the critical elements of the vehicle as well as key objects in the surrounding environment. The analysis of operator visibility during the design process has traditionally been accomplished by building full-scale, static wooden models which the designers and operators sit in and study. The purpose of this movie is to determine if this analysis can be assisted by the animation of a vehicle work cycle in a computer graphics environment. Typically, a computer graphics camera has a horizontal viewing angle of approximately 45 degrees, shown here. By constructing a composite view out of seven cameras, we can expand this angle to 140 degrees. This is an attempt to better map the operator's peripheral vision onto a two-dimensional screen. Across the bottom, additional windows are added to display bucket visibility information. The lower left window shows the portions of the bucket that are visible and hidden. Yellow areas can be seen, gray cannot. This data is graphed over time to the right with the current value displayed in the lower right corner. The main camera across the top is positioned at a fixed eye point within the cab. Naturally, an operator would move his or her head to keep the critical portions of the bucket in view. This scene recreates the light bulb shadow test that is currently used with completed vehicles and mock-ups. Cones of light emanate from a bulb located at the operator's eye point, travel through the windows of the cab, and cast patterns of light and dark on the floor. From this information, designers can determine the blind spots that exist due to structural supports and window placement. A transparent plane located at eye level helps clarify the regions of visibility and blockage from the cab. Although physical models remain a necessary component in the vehicle design process, computer animation allows the designers to assess visibility while operating the backhoe within a virtual proving ground. Very strong winds, rain and hail, moving very rapidly. So we're just ahead of us. Uh, watch for possible debris. So we're entering a high danger zone. You might, uh, if the wind gets too much to battle, you might slow it down. Estimated wind speed 50 to 60 knots. Rain or hail curtains wrapping extremely rapidly. Right, so 11:30, right ahead of us, and very dark ahead. And maybe we'll have better visibility in just a second. We're driving into a strong of cyclone. Okay, now be real careful, Neil. Slow it down. This would be where we drive right into the tornado, so be very, very careful. CG. Rapid circulation right overhead. Slow down, Neil. Stop. Rapid circulation. About one half. Debris! Debris! Tornado passing right in front of us. The understanding of severe storms begins with observations of their behavior. Numerical models of thunderstorms can be used to complement this understanding. These models consist of mathematical equations which can be solved on a supercomputer. Wind, temperature, pressure, and other values are calculated every few seconds for several hundred thousand locations in the area of the storm's development. The numerical storm grows in wind and temperature conditions observed prior to an actual severe thunderstorm. A storm grows quickly from a small cumulus cloud as warm air rises in an updraft. This upwardly moving air reaches a height where it can no longer rise without restraint. It then spreads out, creating a growing anvil. The strong updraft forces the cloud into a dome shape above the anvil. A flanking line of low clouds forms along the gust front. Along this line, storm-generated cold air from the sinking downdraft meets the warm, moist air feeding the updraft. Within the numerical storm, small water and ice particles, shown in gold, can be set apart from the large ones, shown in blue. 
This blue or reflectivity region is what radar typically sees. A vault-like structure is apparent in the updraft region, signifying that large particles have not had time to grow there. The V-notch developing at upper levels indicates that large particles are being swept away from the updraft by strong winds. Radar reflectivity is often displayed within a nearly horizontal slice through a storm. The reddish area in this slice is the region of highest reflectivity. The slider on the color bar points out the maximum concentration of large water particles. Rapid growth is followed by smaller variations as the storm continues to evolve. A characteristic hook shape develops on the south side of the storm. The updraft vault is just to the east of this hook. Airflow relative to the movement of the developing storm is represented by weightless tracer particles. Tracers that rise inside the numerical storm are introduced near the ground to the southeast of the storm. Tracers are released again in the same region as the storm matures. The airflow has a sheet-like appearance that moves and twists through the storm. Air moving several kilometers above the ground approaches the developing storm from the west and eventually descends. Evaporation of water near the ground cools this descending air, creating the gust front. As the storm matures, air moving several kilometers above the ground forms a twisting sheet as it approaches the storm from the south. It then sinks while moving around air which is rushing rapidly upward. Weightless particles released near the ground at regular intervals are colored orange when rising and blue when sinking. Yellow streamers clarify paths taken by individual particles. Initially, all air in and around the storm rises upward. Then, as large precipitation particles form, some of this air begins to fall to the north of the main updraft. This separation of updraft and downdraft is crucial for the continued development of a severe storm. Rotation of air in and around the storm is an important factor in its behavior. A ribbon's rate of twist indicates the amount of local rotation. This is termed streamwise vorticity. The twisting of these ribbons is predominantly clockwise when facing the direction of the ribbon's movement. Substantial rotational growth is evident as the ribbons begin to rise in the updraft or enter the downdraft. Such flow is an important factor in prolonging an individual thunderstorm's life. All of the previous techniques are combined to show the complexity of the storm and correlation of the different features. A cutaway of the cloud reveals the relationship of the interior structure to the rising air within the storm. As computer power increases, so will the understanding of storms, including smaller scale features such as tornadoes. With the use of visualization techniques, the scientist is able to make sense of the growing billions of numbers produced by a single numerical simulation. Numerical models, supercomputers, and visualization will continue to be important tools for studying the behavior of severe storms. Yellowstone National Park has been the topic of a controversy in fire control policy since the ravaging fires of 1988. Scientists are studying a critical issue. Should forest fires be suppressed as they occur, or should natural fires be allowed to burn? Here, a magnified map of Yellowstone is shown. The study area is highlighted in color. Non-destructive tree core samples provide data about the fire history of Yellowstone. To understand the forest dynamics over time, areas of vegetation are color-coded according to age. The youngest forest areas are shown in yellow, the oldest in dark green. Red indicates fire, and black represents non-vegetation. This map shows what actually happened over the past 300 years. During the early years, there were small fires throughout the park. These promoted wide diversity in the age of the forest. 
Small fires turn the old dark green forest to young forest, represented as yellow. Animals utilize portions of the forest most appropriate to their needs. From 1872 to 1972, a policy was enacted to suppress all fires. Notice how the forest ages. The advanced age of the forest, combined with drought and high winds, created favorable conditions for the fires of 1988. The actual landscape dynamics, seen on the right, are now shown beside a fire absence simulation. This simulation is what would have occurred had there been no fires for the past 300 years. Note the lack of landscape diversity as the forest grows older. The tall, old foliage prevents the penetration of sunlight that promotes the growth of forest floor vegetation. Theoretically, a forest in such a condition would be susceptible to a series of large fires. As to the question of whether the 1988 fires would have occurred without the fire control policy, this animation shows that similar large fires have occurred naturally in the past. The Los Angeles, California basin is home to over 10 million people and one of the worst smog problems in the world. Situated on the Pacific Ocean, it is bounded to the north and south by mountains. Satellite imagery shows the various regions and the extent of urbanization in the basin. To understand how pollutants comprising smog are formed and transported within these regions, researchers have developed a complex mathematical model describing the evolution of smog. The domain of the model is shown here. Cars are one of the sources of reactive organic gases, carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxides. This simulation uses actual measurements to show the transport of these pollutants over a three-day period. Each green particle represents 10 tons of reactive organic gases, each yellow particle 10 tons of carbon monoxide, and each red particle 10 tons of nitrogen oxides. Winds from the ocean, shown as arrows, sweep these emissions inland. Weather conditions can cause the air to become trapped in the basin. Trapped organic gases and nitrogen oxides react in the presence of sunlight to form ozone. This air pollution model is used to display the resulting atmosphere. The invisible ozone is represented as a green cloud. Concentrations peak in the afternoon downwind of the heavily populated areas. Carbon monoxide, represented as a yellow cloud, peaks during rush hour in the downtown area. These graphs show the average and peak pollutant concentrations on the ground. A red line indicates the national air quality standard. Nitrate, sulfate, and carbon particles make up the visible components of smog which build up and obscure the sunlight. The Los Angeles smog cloud has become well known in the last five decades. In spite of stringent controls, the problem threatens to become worse. However, by using mathematical models and visualization, researchers and regulators can identify effective solutions that promise to improve the quality of air. Increasing concentrations of trace gases, such as carbon dioxide, are likely to substantially warm our climate through a phenomenon called the greenhouse effect. The heat balance of the Earth atmosphere system is delicately maintained. Radiation arrives from the sun at relatively short wavelengths, which pass through the so-called greenhouse gases comparatively easily. The Earth absorbs some and re-emits infrared radiation at longer wavelengths, which are readily absorbed by the greenhouse gases. Some of this radiation is emitted back toward the Earth and some goes into space.
The more greenhouse gases there are, the more infrared radiation is absorbed in the lower atmosphere. We expect this to cause the temperature near the Earth's surface to warm and the upper atmosphere to cool. Climate simulations shown in this video use a global model that incorporates the atmosphere, ocean, and land. The atmospheric component includes many observed physical processes. The ocean component is more simplified. It stores heat in summer and releases it in winter. It does not simulate ocean currents. The atmospheric model uses a grid of lines 7.5 degrees apart in longitude and 4.5 degrees apart in latitude. It has nine vertical levels distributed between the surface and approximately 30 kilometers. The model equations are solved at the intersection points of the horizontal and vertical grids. Carbon dioxide is the most abundant greenhouse gas. As the experiment with increased carbon dioxide progresses in time, we calculate the globally averaged surface temperature and compare it to the control case. Throughout the experiment, note that the average difference becomes more positive, indicating a global warming. The difference reaches a near equilibrium value of about four degrees Celsius during the last five years. Once again, we use two views of the globe to animate the distribution of the surface temperature difference over the entire planet during the experiment. During the early years, the warmer and cooler regions are roughly equal. As the simulation proceeds, the land masses begin to show more persistent warming. By year five, the warmer regions predominate over the cooler areas. But not all regions of the globe in the carbon dioxide enriched environment are warmer all of the time because a natural climate variability is inherent in the system. Because of this natural variability of the surface temperature, some regions of the globe can be cooler at times. As we approach equilibrium, important features of the impact upon the climate stand out. Warmer areas predominate. The winter hemisphere shows the greatest sensitivity to the warmer climate. The largest warming occurs at high latitudes, where the annual variability of surface temperature is the greatest. By the end of the first year, the distribution of the surface temperature difference shows no trend beyond what we'd expect from pure chance. The same holds true for the soil moisture difference. No special significance should be attached to the changes in surface conditions at this time. As we rotate the analysis into three dimensions, note that the blue surfaces are three-dimensional isosurfaces of minus two degrees Celsius. Likewise, the transparent red isosurfaces represent warming greater than plus 5.5 degrees Celsius. 
The signature of the eventual impact upon the climate is readily apparent in the upper atmosphere. Only one year into the experiment, the stratosphere, in response to the instantaneous doubling of carbon dioxide in the lower atmosphere, shows a clear, consistent expected pattern of cooling over most of the globe. Near the end of the experiment, the average for December through February shows that the largest warming at the surface occurs in the Arctic. Regions of greater soil moisture, colored green, show up in the mid-latitudes of the northern hemisphere. Drier areas in yellow are found over southern Asia, southern North America, and over Africa and South America. As the analysis rotates into three dimensions, the surface warming and stratospheric cooling patterns stand out. Near the North Pole, the greatest surface warming is found just east of Greenland. The winter polar region exhibits the largest warming at the surface because the sea ice boundary has retreated in the warmer climate. In June, July and August, the largest average difference in surface temperature is again in the winter hemisphere, this time around the South Pole. Some of the wetter regions at the surface have persisted from winter into summer over parts of the northern hemisphere continents, while the drier regions are still evident farther south and in Africa, in South America, and now in Australia. In three dimensions, the areas of greatest warming lie in the southern hemisphere. The stratosphere again exhibits a strong, consistent pattern of cooling due to changes in the radiation balance caused by the increased greenhouse gases. Over the next decade, as computer models of climate systems improve and computational capability advances, the scientific community will be able to provide more definite and accurate predictions of climate changes. The United States and other countries around the world are planning and conducting an international scientific effort aimed at improving the estimations of regional climate changes. Now we will use maximal slicing to study the generation of gravitational radiation from a dynamic black hole. If the black hole is initially distorted, it will oscillate and cause ripples in the geometry of the surrounding space-time. These ripples are the gravitational waves. Only a portion of the entire embedding diagram is shown here in order to better see the gravitational radiation. The color map we use in this sequence measures the shearing of the space-time due to the waves. Viewing the same calculation with a high-frequency color map to bring out detail, we can see that some of the waves fall into the black hole and remain trapped there, while others, once having left the region close to the event horizon, slowly make their way out of this deep gravitational potential in escape to infinity.
One day, Americans use enough toothpaste to encircle the globe. In one week, we use enough cans and bottles to wrap the earth four times. In one year, two billion razors. In one year, two billion batteries. In one year, 14 million tons of cardboard boxes. 14 million tons of cardboard boxes. 14 million tons of cardboard boxes. 26 World Trade Centers filled with glass. 50 million tons of batteries. 500,000 trees are cut down from newspapers every Sunday. In five years, we will have lost one third of our country's landfills. Over half of U.S. cities will run out of landfills in 10 years. Hey, recycle your stuff.